Good evening, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our guest today. Uh, this is uh, because uh, we, have, we have some special occasion and our guest today is uh, not only uh, a long-time collaborator of mine, I mean for those maybe who don't know me, my name is Rainer Spolzheim, I'm from Ari, I'm currently very often in China, so some of you may have not seen me, but I see also many, many uh, known faces. So our visitor, Professor Hyun Mok Lee from Seoul National University in Korea, has uh, just received the Humboldt Research Award and uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, we are very proud actually, uh, Pavel Krupa from Bonn and I to be his host and welcome him here in Germany so he can use this award to stay and uh, spend some time for research visits in Germany. And Hyung uh, Mok Lee uh, actually uh, graduated with his bachelor and master in Seoul National University in uh, 1979 and 81, the master 81, and then he moved to Princeton where he did his PhD in astrophysics in uh, 1986, and uh, afterwards he was working as a research fellow, postdoc research fellow at the CETA, the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics in Toronto, in Canada, all very well known places. Uh, before he then moved back to Korea as a professor to first to Busan National University, which is in the southern end of Korea. And uh, then there was a visiting uh, research physicist in Santa Barbara in 93. Before uh, then in 98, he became a regular full professor at Seoul National University. He's working there at the Department of Astronomy. I think currently you are the director of the institute. So what is it? Not now. Not now, okay. Just over. Oh, my, last, my last visit. And uh, he has uh, reserved, uh, received some awards the uh, John Polanyi Prize of Ontario, Canada, 1988, and the National Medal for Science Achievements uh, of the Korean government in 2010. And last but not least, the Alexander von Humboldt Award now, uh, actually now is already last year, 2013 actually. Uh, his uh, working areas are focused on stellar dynamics. Uh, this is also uh, the field of our collaboration for more than past 10 years. Uh, but uh, uh, his research interests are much wider. In, uh, many areas, theoretical, observational astrophysics, uh, space-based, uh, infrared astronomy, for example. But recently, uh, like uh, many of us, he has also turned uh, an open eye to the new window of gravitational wave astrophysics, and I understand that you will give us an insight into this field now. So thank you, Hugh Mokley, and uh, please start your talk. So now we have to, I have to pass this microphone to you. And so on. 
Okay, then I'll uh, make a brief summary. Okay, so uh, as a, a very uh, brief introduction to gravitational waves, let me start with the uh, uh, how the uh, estimation of the gravitational wave uh, amplitude, which is uh, called strain amplitude, and this is a, a variation of uh, some length. Uh, due to the gravitational waves, and uh, this can be expressed as a, as a uh, rate of changes of the uh, quadrupole moment and, and the uh, distance to the to the object, and of course the uh, the quadrupole moment is m square m times r square, and usually you don't expect too much changes of the of this quantity. Uh, there is, but however, there are some uh, circumstances where the, there is a, a big changes, such as the uh, the merger of the binaries. So uh, when the there is a sudden changes of quadrupole moment, uh, the this quantity could be maximum of this quantity could be m c square. Of course, it's usually much smaller than this, but could be uh, very close, close to the MC scale. And uh, when such a thing happens, uh, the uh, amplitude can be expressed as a, a maximum, I mean the maximum amplitude expressed as a Schwarzschild radius of the, of the uh, object uh, divided by the distance. And if you plug in the, uh, the numbers, it, come up with the number of something like this. This 5 times 5, uh, 10 to the minus 21 for the uh, tensile mass object at the distance of 200 megaparsec. Now, uh, the reason why I'm using these numbers is that the, the typical mass of the uh, object we expect uh, to produce uh, this amount of gravitational waves is uh, either a neutron star, so black holes, and the distance is about 200 megaparsec, uh, which is a kind of a horizon distance of the current uh, gravitational wave detectors. This number is, is a, a really small number, so this corresponds to 0.03 millimeter change for a distance of one parsec. So uh, this is exactly the reason why the gravitational waves has, have not been uh, detected uh, directly yet. Uh, however, we expect that the, the real detection will, uh, uh, will be done in the near future because there are several gravitational waves, wave detectors already operating or under uh, upgrade. Uh, these are the LIGO, uh, which is located, uh, there are actually two LIGO detectors, one in Hanford, Washington, and the other uh, in Livingston, Louisiana. And uh, not far from here, there is a gravitational wave detector called Virgo uh, in Italy. And uh, Japan, Japan is also constructing a new gravitational wave detector in Kamioka Mine, which is famous for the uh, neutrino experiment. And uh, also in India, there is a discussion uh, to construct another, another copy of LIGO uh, in India. It's not uh, fully approved yet, but uh, probably they will start uh, working in the near future. So, uh, this is the sensitivities of current and upcoming detectors. Now, the, this, this line is actual uh, sensitivity measured from the LIGO. Uh, it's called S6. Uh, S6 means the science run number 6. And uh, now the, the LIGO together with Virgo are being upgraded to the uh, to the detector port advanced detectors and they will be 
called advanced LIGO and advanced VERBO. And uh, this is the uh, expected sensitivity line. You see the strain amplitude. Uh, this is a uh, noise power spectrum. Uh, so it's, it's a strain per square root hertz. And as a function of frequency, you see the frequency runs from uh, 10 to uh, a few kilohertz. And uh, the important thing is that the, the, uh, compared to the current sensitivity, the new sensitivity of the advanced detectors will, it will be approximately 10 times better uh, in almost all frequencies. And uh, 10 times better frequency means, uh, uh, sensitivity means that the um, horizon distance will be 10 times larger. Now, uh, the, the reason is that unlike uh, unlike the uh, photon detectors, this gravitational wave detector actually measures the amplitude of the wave, which is inversely proportional to the distance. And therefore, if you increase the sensitivity by a factor of 10, then the, uh, the distance you can observe will be increased by a factor of 10, which uh, corresponds to the uh, factor of 1000 uh, increase in, in, in volume. So, uh, so the, the current horizon distance is like this, and the, the future horizon will be like this. And the, for the case of neutron star neutron star merger, the current uh, horizon distance is approximately 25 to 30 megaparsec, but the advanced detectors will reach about 200 megaparsec. Now, uh, so, so we, we will be able to cover uh, many more galaxies with the advanced detectors and uh, that's the reason why we are hope, expecting that the real detection will be made by the advanced detectors. Now let me move on to the gravitational wave sources, or, although already I have uh, talked about the neutron star neutron star mergers, but uh, there are more. Uh, than the neutron star neutron star modules. So, uh, in gravitational wave community, they uh, divide the, the gravitational wave sources into four categories. Uh, one is compact binary coalescence, uh, which produces the gravitational waves uh, for a very short moment. And uh, another gravitational wave source is, is called burst. It also produces uh, gravitational waves for a for very, very brief period. But the difference between this one and this one is that the, uh, this one, we already know the, the uh, waveforms of the gravitational waves. However, the burst is uh, kind of unknown. We, we don't know exactly the, uh, the waveforms, but we only know that, that there's a possibility of having uh, a very short duration burst of gravitational waves. So uh, the reason why we distinguish between these two uh, types of sources is that the uh, detection algorithms are different. Uh, here, since we know the uh, gravitational, wave, gravitational waveforms, uh, as a function of, of course, it depends on the mass and so on, uh, but we can change this, these parameters, and uh, then we can use the matched filter technique. Uh, to find the gravitational waves. However, in the burst, since we don't know the exact forms, we, uh, we use different technique, which is called excess power. And there is another type of source, which is the periodic source. Uh, this is a gravitational wave uh, produced by by, for example, asymmetric neutron stars, and they can uh, generate gravitational waves for for the extended period with the, uh, just one uh, frequency. Uh, finally, there is uh, another type of gravitational wave, which is called, which is called stochastic. Uh, the the uh, corresponding type of uh, electromagnetic wave is, is the background radiation. 
background radiation, cosmic uh, background radiation, or, or whatever background radiation. So stochastic uh, gravitational wave means uh, the gravitational wave sources uh, that uh, we don't, we cannot distinguish as an individual source, but a uh, mixture of many, many sources, uh, including very distant uh, binaries or uh, cosmological origin. So this is called a uh, stochastic source and uh, we can use kind of cross-correlation technique. Uh, we uh, measure the, uh, we compare the signals at different patches of the sky uh, and uh, by doing so we can uh, detect the uh, stochastic waves. However, the, the, at the moment, uh, this is the most promising gravitational wave sources for the advanced detectors, at least for the initial period. So I'm going to concentrate on the uh, compact binaries. So uh, the compact binary coalescence is, uh, there are several types, several uh, candidates. Uh, one is neutron star, neutron star binary merger. And uh, this is also a candidate of short gamma ray burst. And therefore, simultaneous detection of gravitational wave and electromagnetic uh, radiation is possible. And of course, it's very desirable. Another type of source is, is neutron star black hole binary. And uh, this has some similarity and dif difference between neutron star, neutron star, and neutron star uh, black hole uh, in the sense that it also can produce electro electromagnetic radiation. And finally, there is a, a black hole, black hole binaries. And uh, they are black holes, the individual mass of the black holes is larger than the uh, neutron star. And the, uh, roughly speaking, the gravitational wave amplitude is proportional to the mass of the object. And therefore, uh, the, uh, although they can be rare, but uh, the signal can be strong. And that means that the horizon is larger. Now, the, the rate of the black hole black hole binary merger is, is very uncertain. Just because uh, we don't know, actually, we don't have any examples of the black hole black hole binaries. Now, uh, uh, neutron star neutron star binaries, we know that there are uh, binary pulsars. Neutron star black hole. We don't have the candidate either, but uh, probably there exists such a thing. This one, there they might exist, but there is no other signature uh, except for the, uh, for the gravitational waves. Therefore, uh, it may be possible, we can, possible that these types of binaries exist in the sky. Uh, we don't have a good, uh, good estimation of the waves. So, uh, um, I'm going to concentrate on the black hole, uh, black hole binaries uh, because there might be a very robust way of forming such binaries in the stellar systems. So, um, the compact binaries, how they are formed? Uh, of course, they are formed by the, by the binaries. If you have uh, binary system with, uh, with larger mass, then uh, they evolve in a complex way and at the end they, uh, they may be end up, they may uh, form uh, compact binaries composed of neutron stars or black holes, etc. Uh, but there is other uh, formation processes of uh, uh, compact binaries. Uh, one possibility is captured by gravitational radi radiation. So this is the uh, when there is a very uh, strange situation where the compact stars, black holes or neutron stars, they uh, they encounter they they experience close encounter, then the gravitational radiation will make the uh, the, the two systems into a boundary. So this is a gravitational wave capture process. 
And there is another possibility, which is a three-body process, uh, which is uh, less bizarre, but uh, uh, still needs very high densities of uh, compact stars. And uh, this, in, these are the dynamical processes, and they, uh, they are more sensitive to the density than the total amount of stars. And that means uh, the estimation of the of the uh, these binaries uh, formation of these binaries may be very uncertain. Uh, however, there are there are stellar systems with a very high stellar density in, in the uh, in the galaxies, which are global clusters or galactic nuclei, and they could be an important place uh, for the formation or production of black hole black hole binaries. Uh, recently, there have been several works in, in this area and uh, we are also, I'm going to uh, introduce our work uh, for this process. Before doing that, uh, let me show you the uh, neutron star binaries. Uh, there are about 10 neutron star binaries already known uh, in our galaxy. So these are the list of these binaries. Now, um, this, this is a long and uh, complex table, but uh, I want to uh, highlight some of the parameters, uh, the masses of the individual component. You see that uh, typically th these masses are in the range of 1.3 to 1.6 solar mass. And uh, orbital period, there's a range of the orbital periods, a few hours to uh, pro to several hundred hours, the eccentricity distribution. And then uh, you can use this uh, orbit, orbital period and eccentricity to estimate the uh, time scale to merge uh, through gravitational radiation. So uh, for this, of course this is a very famous uh, pulsar per system, B19, 13 plus 16. It's called uh, a Hurst-Taylor pulsar, which was first uh, binary pulsar observed. And uh, since the orbital period is very short, uh, they they make a very tight orbit, and uh, the they pr produce gravitational radiation, and the orbit decays and it takes about uh, 300 million years uh, to become mergers. So if you wait for 300 million years, they become mergers. There is another uh, very compact binary, which has a really short uh, time scale for merger, which is only uh, 80, 86 million years. And uh, this, so th these are the binaries whose uh, more time scale for the merge merging is much shorter than the Hubble time. Uh, there are other binaries uh, whose merging time is much longer. So uh, this this merging time is really very sensitive function of the orbital uh, orbital period. So seven hours less than Hubble time, but if it's uh, more than 20, 20 hours, then the, uh, the time scale is too long. So we can use actually these systems to make an estimation of the uh, kind of uh, merging rate in our galaxy, which is uh, shown here. So uh, this is the probability distribution of the merging rate, neutron star, neutron star merger rate. Uh, so this is for our galaxy. And uh, you see that the, the rate of merger is, lies between a few to few tens uh, per million years in our galaxy. So, uh, in our galaxy, uh, although the merging can take place, but it's so rare that there is no possibility to, 
to actually uh, detect the uh, neutron star neutron star motion. However, uh, if you, the horizon distance of the gravitational wave detector is, is large, uh, then uh, we can make a very frequent detection. For example, the advanced detector, uh, the sens with the sensitivity of, of the advanced detector I have shown, uh, we expect order of 10 uh, neutron star neutron star merger events per year, uh, which is, I think, if you can detect 10 events per year, uh, maybe we will be able to make a direct detection uh, just after the inauguration of the advanced detectors. So that's, that's the reason why uh, we are we are looking forward to the uh, first detection in a few years because the advanced detectors will, will be available uh, in a couple of years. Now, uh, based on this kind of studies, uh, there is an official paper called RAID paper by the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. Uh, so, uh, for the neutron star, neutron stars, uh, they expect that the actual detection rate will range from 1 to 1,000. So there is a significant, there is a big uh, uncertainty and with the uh, realistic estimation of 100, which is a little bit higher than the number I have shown. Uh, but uh, it depends on, on, the, uh, on, on different estimations. Now, if you look at this neutron star black hole motion, uh, I'm sorry, I, I think the number I have quoted is the, uh, not the real detection rate, but the, this, this is funny unit, but per Milky Way equivalent galaxy, per million years. So you have to multiply this number by the horizon distance and so on. Uh, but what, what I would like to uh, emphasize is that the, uh, there is a substantial uncertainty uh, from 1 to 1000 and from 0.05 to 100 for the neutron star black hole and black hole black hole uh, 0.101 to 300 as 30. So the range here is about 1,000. This is, I think it's about 2,000. And this is about 3,000. And uh, these kind of uncertainties reflect the fact that the, at least neutron star, neutron stars, we have uh, several systems, several examples in our galaxy. But uh, these two systems, we don't have any examples. So we completely rely on the, uh, the population synthesis model. And uh, therefore, because there is no way to calibrate, uh, the, the uncertainty is, uh, is very, uncertainty is very large. Okay, so then let's move on to the question of what parameters we can determine from gravitational waves. So physical parameters, uh, I'm only concentrating on the compact binaries. And the assumptions is that the uh, neutron star black hole binaries, and this is another important assumption that the centristic at the time of the margin will be zero. Now the reason why we make this assumption is that the uh, the orbital, if you look at the orbital evolution of the compact binaries, uh, the, as the gravitational waves change the orbit, uh, the, the orbit shrinks and the centricity also becomes small. And the, the, although the centricities of the uh, neutron star binaries I have shown have radius uh, starting from small number to, to 0.7, something like that, but since it, uh, you will have to wait for a very long time, uh, at the, 
the eccentricity evolution leads to the uh, zero eccentricity when they merely uh, produce uh, the significant amount of gravitational waves. So this, this is a kind of a very realistic assumption. The parameters that determine the, uh, the gravitational wave amplitude can be divided into two. One is intrinsic, which is masses and spins. And uh, also there is extrinsic, which is distance and source, location in the sky, and orbital plane, uh, the orbital plane relative to the line of sight. And these are called extrinsic quantities. Uh, one of the weakest points of the gravitational wave detectors is that the sky localization is really very poor. Uh, because just one uh, gravitational wave detector does not have any, uh, any directional capability. So we have to rely on the triangulation uh, based on the, uh, the uh, time, arrival time difference. So if you have two detectors, uh, there will be, uh, based on the time difference, uh, there will be a possibility of the source being located in, in a ring. And if you have two detect three detectors, then we have two rings, and therefore uh, two rings will meet at two points, and, and uh, then uh, we can somehow reject one point uh, by, by consistency of the, of the polarization and so on. So, uh, in principle, if we have three detectors, uh, if we detect the gravitational waves by three detectors almost simultaneously, then we can determine the uh, direction of the sky. Uh, the resolution is determined by the time resolution. The angular resolution is determined by the time resolution. And these are time resolutions of each detector, and this is the uh, baseline, the, the time difference. And uh, th this is not very long because uh, they are located in our Earth, and therefore a few milliseconds is the typical number. And the, these numbers are typically uh, 0.1 millisecond. And if you translate this into the angular resolution, Actually, uh, the resolution is really poor. So, uh, this is uh, the map uh, in the Earth-based coordinate about the angular resolution uh, with the uh, HLB means uh, two LIO detectors and one door wall, so three detectors. And depending on the, on the location of the sky, you have good locations here and bad locations here. Now the reason why there, there is good location and bad location is that the uh, three detectors form a plane and uh, toward the, toward the uh, <coughs> genus of the plane you have good resolution. But if it's along the plane, you have really bad resolution. And uh, so uh, this analysis is really complicated, but the, if you have one more detector, the, this is a four detectors, uh, H, L, B, and there is an I, I means uh, LIGO India, and then you have a uh, relatively good uh, coverage in the sky. But the LIGO India will be available only in, uh, not, not in the near future because they haven't started working yet. So, for the time being, until 2012, uh, we have to rely on three detectors and the, uh, the percent, percent of uh, binary neutron star localization within five square degree is only three to eight, three to eight percent. <laughs> and uh, 20 square degrees is eight to 28 percent. And everything else is uh, much, much worse. So the, uh, the conclusion is that the uh, angular resolution is at least a few tens of degrees, square degrees, uh, which means that the, uh, it's really difficult to, to know 
uh, where the, the gravitational wave source is coming. Uh, so the angular resolution is poor. Now, the, how about the mass? Now, uh, the gravitational wave is waveform depends on the on this quantity, and uh, this quantity in the post-Newtonian approximation uh, ha has this form, and uh, this quantity depends on the uh, chart mass. This quantity chart mass. Chart mass is a strange combination of the mass, and but. Uh, this eta is the uh, mass ratio, and therefore, uh, with 1 pn, 1 pn means order of uh, v square, v, v divided c square, c square. and uh, so there is a possibility of uh, having, uh, being able to determine the individual mass because we have the chart mass and the mass ratio. And uh, the spin comes into the effect on 1.5 pn. This just shows you that there is a, although this, you may be able to uh, determine the chart mass and the mass ratio and spin simultaneously from the uh, gravitational waves, but it's not really uh, easy because uh, gravitational waves First of all, dominated by the chalk mass, this is a small fraction, and this is another small fraction. And uh, what that means is that the, uh, when you actually de detect the gravitational waves, chalk mass is very accurately constrained, but the uh, individual mass is not uh, really well determined. For if there is no spin, the 20% the, uh, in the accuracy in 20% in individual mass, but uh, if uh, neutrons try spinning, then there is a degeneracy between the spin and the mass ratio. So uh, the individual mass, the conclusion is individual mass is poorly constrained, and the, uh, even if we detect the gravitational waves, uh, the ambiguities between uh, black hole and neutron star would remain. The, the, the reason is that the, uh, we don't know the exact mass of the individual mass, although the chart mass uh, gives you different combinations. And uh, if you want to really distinguish between black holes and neutron stars, you have to uh, make a good estimation of the individual mass, which is, seems to be a little bit difficult. Uh, one good aspect of the gravitational waves is that the gravitational wave signal from binary inspired inspire is called uh, standard siren. Uh, this, it is a uh, very similar concept with the standard candle. Now the uh, unlike standard candle, standard candle means even though we don't know exact physical reason, we, uh, we, uh, we know that the certain, uh, certain object have uh, kind of absolute magnitude, constant absolute magnitude. Uh, however, here, this is a gravitational wave signals uh, produced by the black holes or neutron stars, which are relatively simple object. Therefore, the, uh, the gravitational wave forms can be accurately calculated. And therefore, this is a, a standard siren without uh, needing any calibration. So, uh, for high signal to noise ratio sources, the, the, with this standard siren hypothesis, we can uh, determine the uh, luminosity distance without uh, any, any further knowledge. And, however, of course, the, there is noise, therefore, the uncertainty is inversely proportional to the signal to noise ratio. Uh, uh, for the advanced LIGO, advanced LIGO and advanced BORO, a typical signal to noise ratio we expect is an order of a 10. And therefore, uh, therefore the, uh, the accuracy of the 
uh, distance estimation is order of 10 percent, but slightly higher because it's not a really exactly one. So um, this is an interesting, interesting possibility. So gravitational wave observations can be used for the probe of the cosmology if the redshift can be observed uh, toward the gravitational wave sources. Now, the reason why I'm saying is that uh, we can measure the luminosity distance, but uh, we have to make a correlation with the luminosity distance to the redshift uh, to probe the uh, geometry of the universe. Of course, uh, the uh, one difficulty is that we have to identify this, the uh, gal hosting galaxy. And the identification of the host galaxy uh, is important, but uh, very difficult. Just because of the poor knowledge on the direction. One uh, interesting possibility of uh, identifying host galaxy is that the, uh, through the electromagnetic radiation that comes together with the gravitational waves. So, as I said earlier, if one of the merging component is a neutron star, uh, then electromagnetic radiation is expected uh, during and after the merging. So, this is uh, the model of the neutron star, neutron star mergers, and the uh, when they merge together, there's black hole forms and uh, there is a accretion disk and uh, then there is a jet and if the jet and interstellar medium sh um, flies, there is a shock and uh, we expect optical afterglow just after the uh, formation of the black hole and the gamma ray emission powered by the accretion onto black hole uh, is thought to be a model for the short gamma ray burst. Of course, th this and this is different phenomena. This is a gamma ray burst, and this is an optical, uh, optical counterpart. And after the merger, still, uh, the kilonova, due to the radioactive emission by uh, our process element, uh, so the neutron star neutron star merger may produce the kilonova, which is the model. Uh, of the optical counterpart for the uh, short gamma ray burst. But unfortunately, they peak in the near infrared uh, because of the high, due to high opacity. Now, the near infrared is, uh, is not an easy wavelength to observe from the ground. So that's uh, remaining uh, difficulty. So, neutron star, neutron star mergers. Uh, are thought to be the uh, short gamma ray burst, but uh, estimated neutron star neutron star rate is about, as I said, about 10 to 20 uh, for the uh, per year for the advanced detectors. But uh, unfortunately, within the uh, short gamma ray burst, the, the observed short gamma ray burst are all observed uh, at the distance much farther than the uh, current, uh, uh, the horizon of the advanced detectors. So this is the uh, ad uh, advanced LIGO, I'm, I'm sorry, ad advanced LIGO and Borgo neutron star neutron star merging uh, distance. And within this distance, there has been no, uh, no short gamma ray burst observed yet. But the, the theory uh, estimates, predicts that there should have been about 20, there should be about 20 per year. Uh, short gamma ray burst, based on the, uh, the observed rates and the, their sky coverage, etc., uh, the expected rate is about 0.3 per year within 200 megaparsecs. And uh, so there, there is a big discrepancy between 0.3 and 20. And uh, so why, why there is such a big discrepancy? Uh, people suspect that the beaming, we are only seeing the short gamma ray burst toward, uh, toward the jet direction. So we are missing many more. Uh, which means that actually 
uh, even though we, we may be able to detect many gravitational wave phenomena with the advanced detectors, still the uh, counterpart as a short gamma ray burst will be very rare, which means that the uh, optical count, uh, uh, detecting optical counterpart is not an easy, easy thing. So the difficulty is, is that the sources are not well localized. Uh, although the, the, we, we may detect gravitational waves, we don't know the, the sky location very well. So we have to search a uh, very wide field uh, from the gravitational waves. And um, within 100 square degrees, we expect there will be about 1,000 galaxies. So uh, the, we have to search individual galaxies, which is not easy. And uh, electromagnetic afterglow becomes very faint in a short time, so uh, we need large telescopes. So these are, are contradictory. Uh, wide field telescopes are usually uh, usually small, and uh, but we need large telescopes to detect faint light, and they are light, likely to be bright in near infrared, and the, uh, that's a weak point of the gravity. Uh, the uh, ground-based uh, telescopes. Okay, so if I summarize what I have said, it, that the, uh, we may expect many gravitational waves in with advanced detectors, uh, but the identification of the nature of the individual sources uh, will not be easy. Uh, let me. So how, how much time? Okay, so uh, actually this is the remaining half of my <laughs> talk, but uh, maybe I'll just uh, make a very, very brief, uh, go through very quickly. So what I want to say right now is that the, I said that the black hole black hole binary stuff will be, uh, I mean the weight of black hole black hole binary is very, very uncertain uh, in view of the uh, population synthesis because uh, population synthesis models uh, rely on many, many assumptions, uh, for example, mass functions and evolution of binaries and so on. But you have to make a kind of uh, uh, interim checks with the uh, observed systems. And the, for the case of neutron star, neutron star binaries, since there are uh, observed systems, you can uh, calibrate uh, the, the population synthesis to the observations. However, black hole black hole binaries, since there is no, uh, no examples known, uh, it, uh, I think that the, the uncertainty is very large. Now, um, the, but in, if you only look at the uh, dense stellar systems like, uh, uh, like globular clusters and galactic nuclei, uh, then you can estimate you can make estimate of the binary formations and uh, you know the characteristics of these binaries very well uh, because, because uh, dynamics uh, dictate, dictate the parameters of the binaries, etc. So, uh, what I would like to report uh, here is that the, uh, in global clusters and galactic nuclei, uh, you can make an estimate of such binaries. Of course, you have, you have to make an assumptions as to the uh, fraction of black holes and fraction of neutron stars and so on. Uh, but uh, but we, we know that the uh, the initial mass functions, etc. And uh, therefore, you know, based on such knowledge, we can make an est make estimates. And uh, so. First of all, there are many globular clusters in our galaxy, and there are even more globular clusters in the, uh, in the elliptical galaxies. Now, uh, uncertainties is that, the, of course, uh, neutron star, for example, if you talk about the neutron star binaries, then the, uh, the, there is a uh, possibility of the neutron stars being kicked out when they are formed by this supernova explosion. 
but you can you still see a lot of uh, millisecond pulsars in global clusters, which means that the uh, the kicks uh, maybe the kicks uh, may not completely. I mean this this. Uh, the, still, you have many uh, neutron stars. You can keep many neutron stars in uh, in global clusters. And uh, another interesting thing about uh, global, uh, global clusters is that the uh, the current population of global clusters may be just a small fraction uh, of the initial populations because global clusters are fragile systems. So uh, any estimation you make based on the current population is can be regarded as a low limit because there could have been many global clusters lived long time ago. They have produced such binaries. They are still uh, still moving around our galaxy, and uh, so that's that's the motivation of working on the uh, global clusters. Uh, since I don't have time. I just want to uh, show you that the, uh, the first of all, the, you can form binaries, and the binaries become tight and tight through the interaction with uh, other stars, and uh, eventually they, they are kicked out uh, because interaction between binaries and singles also give you the uh, recoil, and uh, so very simple estimation gives you that the, the, the binary orbit becomes tight and it can be only characterized by the escape velocity. So, uh, so with the n-body simulations, uh, very simplified, simplified n-body simulations composed of uh, main sequence stars and neutron stars and the black holes and even the primordial uh, binaries, you can uh, you can do make the simulations, and then uh, if I summarize the the uh, n body simulations, uh, almost all the black holes evaporate in short time, but they evaporate uh, in the form of singles and binaries, and uh, the, these, the evaporate binaries are tight binaries, and. Uh, so 30% of these objects are in the form of compact binaries and uh, therefore the number of ejected binaries is 50%, 15% in total. And uh, black hole neutron star binaries are very rare. Uh, just because this dynamical process uh, the always act uh, to form a very compact core composed of the highest mass component. And in the beginning, black holes uh, form the very dense core and then they get evaporated, then neutron stars start. And uh, the, the parameters, with the parameters we have surveyed, the presence of primordial binaries does not change the uh, results since they are easily destroyed. But of course that depends on the, uh, the uh, uh, prime, uh, the physical parameters of the primordial binaries. Now, uh, we can use the, this uh, numerical result uh, to estimate the number of expected binaries uh, ejected from the global clusters, and then you can count how many of these binaries will merge uh, to produce gravitational waves within Hubble time. And, uh, so, uh, so this is uh, our final uh, result uh, for the neutron star neutron star merger. is is relatively small number, uh, 0.05 to 0.5. But the uh, black hole black hole is is also small. But uh, as I said, this the horizon is much larger. Therefore, you expect many uh, black hole black hole binary mergers within the horizon of the advanced detectors. Of course, there are many uncertainties. And, uh, so, the uncertainties is that the, uh, 
first of all, neutron star kick. Neutron star kick is very uncertain, so we assume 90% of neutron stars will, uh, will be kicked at the time of their birth. However, the black holes have, are thought to have very small uh, kicks, therefore black hole population is okay. Uh, we used only 141 clusters with known parameters. Uh, since, uh, based on our simulations, we can, uh, we can correlate uh, between the, uh, we can correlate the, the rate of the binary formation with the escape velocity and the total mass. So we need escape velocity and total mass to make a, a binary the contribution from individual clusters. And, uh, but this, this is the clusters we, we know about these parameters. Of course, these are the, uh, the partial number, and we expect there will be uh, more than 200 in the galaxy because there are hidden regions. And uh, therefore, if you count them, uh, it will be our estimation is underestimated. And the destroyed global clusters, and uh, therefore, there will be. Uh, contribution from the clusters already destroyed, the underestimation, and so on. So the actual uh, number will be much larger than our estimate, and which is already a uh, quite significant number. Uh, now the the galactic nuclei, uh, the situation is a little bit different uh, because the the formation process is different from the global clusters in the sense that they, uh, there is a central black hole and therefore the uh, uh, stellar systems form cusp and in the cusp uh, the, the density and velocity dispersion becomes large and therefore you form uh, binaries by capture, gravitational wave capture and uh, so uh, this is Again, again, detailed models and um, the interesting property of these captured binaries is that they are very, very eccentric. The eccentricity 1 minus E is like a 10 to minus 4 and the time scale for the merger is very short. It's only 10 days for our galaxy. Um, this is the, uh, the semi-major axis. And therefore, the, these binaries have an, uh, have an interesting property that the, they, they remain eccentric until the merger. And uh, therefore, the waveforms are different from the circular binaries, as I assumed in the previous, uh, previous estimation on, the, uh, on the how we can determine the parameters and so on. So if you know, these binaries will have have a different characteristic uh, when they, they are observed in the advanced detectors. And then the next question is the, the rate of, of the such binaries. And there was, so let me just go quickly go to the, uh, this page. This expected detection rate uh, is ranges from 0.02 to 10 per year in our estimation. Uh, actually, we did this study because of uh, all the claim by Warrieri et al. that the, uh, such binaries will be very frequent uh, in their 2009 paper. And we found that the, uh, this seems to be a little bit higher. And, uh, but still, it's a significant number. Uh, so, so, there might be an interesting possibility that we actually observe these eccentric binaries. And uh, therefore, with this, I will just make a, a brief summary about what I have said. First of all, the direct detection of gravitational wave, wave will tell us about the existence of standard mass black holes and their masses, of course, with the uncertainties. However, significant uncertainties in the individual masses will remain. Uh, if electromagnetic count counterpart is observed, 
we could have more information for sort of, uh, such as connection between the uh, neutron star neutron star or neutron star black hole merger uh, association with the uh, short gamma ray burst or kilonova and host galaxies and the location within the galaxy and uh, also we have some uh, constraint on the formation mechanisms of, of compact binaries for example if we observe any eccentric binaries eccentric merger uh, of the black holes that means that the, the formation mechanism is uh, is kind of thing I have described that the a great the direct capture by gravitational waves. And uh, another interesting question is: Are there more black hole binaries or neutron star binaries? Because uh, according to uh, some estimates, there will be more black hole binaries than neutron star binaries. And the uh, advanced detectors the, uh, will tell us about at least these partial answers on these, uh, uh, these questions. I'm sorry, I spin, I'm talking about the spin? Uh, no, I'm talking about how you were able to organize the multi-wavelength. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a business of the uh, line of collaboration. And uh, so they made a call for the uh, collaboration to the astronomers that the uh, so the, the there will be an agreement between the uh, astronomers and gravitational wave scientists that the, in such a way that if there is any uh, signal from the gravitational wave detectors, they will give this information to the astronomers and they look for the sky. Uh, but the details of the uh, of the observational studies and so on is not uh, determined. Because as I said, the, the, the error circle is so large, uh, it, it's, it's not realistic for any individual uh, astronomical instrument will detect the uh, counterpart. And therefore, uh, we need a very, very well-organized strategy to sort how to sort these error circles and so on. So that's about optical, but the uh, gamma rays and so on, they, they may be different. Because they already have a, a large, uh, large viewing angle. So, further questions? Okay. Yeah. So, how close to the sun should be a typical merger? that the current detectors could uh, detect it? Well, the, uh, the Pulse Halo, Pulsar, has an orbital separation of uh, about 1.6 million kilometers. I think it's over a million kilometers. But they, uh, their time scale is 300 million years. Therefore, at least uh, the, the neutron star, I mean, if you're talking about neutron stars, uh, the orbital separation has to be smaller than uh, a couple of million kilometers. Okay, uh, like uh, about the distance to the sun, so I think we, am I correct that we cannot detect mergers which are very further away, like in, in the galactic halo or even in hexagonal. So, and the distance out of which you can detect these mergers is the question. Uh, this neutron star, neutron stars, 200 nanoparsecs. If any such event takes place in our galaxy, it's going to be a very, very large event. But uh, the, the uh, expected rate is order of 10 per million year. Therefore, we have, to, uh, we have to look for millions of galaxies. Okay. And, uh, 
within the distance of few hundred nanoparsecs, we, uh, there may be a sufficient number of, of galaxies that can produce uh, gravitational wave sources. Gravitational waves. Thank you. Okay, so let's go up to New York. <laughs> Talking about the boiling point, um, in order to have a signal of a critical strength, you need to be close to the front of the radius. Uh, sorry? In order to have a signal which is strong enough, yeah. you need to be close to the front of the radius. Yeah. Uh, so the yes, yes, two, two, two objects should be close to the front of the radius. radius. So the, the wave that you receive will be enormously reduced. Uh, Well, it's still, but still, it's, it's still significantly far from the uh, far from the uh, the short shield radius, and I, I, I'm not sure about the uh, redshift. Uh, but actual th these estimations are made at a large distance, already at a large distance. Yeah. From but the, 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 the frequency of the wave that you will receive is yeah. much larger. Sorry, it was much slow, much lower than the frequency of the of the orbit of motion uh, because of that direction. But I haven't thought about that. Uh, well, for equal mass, I would say for equal mass objects, they can't approach each other more than about twice their. Yeah, still, great, still. Great. I, I think this point is true. Still, there is a good plan. In fact, true. But so you don't know how. You don't know by how much. So I'm, I'm wondering how do you, how do you infer parameters or open parameters and say, of the object you're looking at, if you don't know the region? I mean, the, the resin to the to the object or the no the gravitational gravitational resin of the wave coming out of the. I'm not sure gravitational waves are really coming out of the potential well. They comment, yes, actually, so there are two issues. I think if you want to observe this effect, then you need to have a point mass which is falling on a black hole. And then when the point mass coming close to the spot of radius, you, you will see this gravitational ratio effect and the frequency changes. But here, if you have two equal mass or two comparable mass objects, um, this has been tested both by full numerical solutions of, of, uh, of the field equation and also by post Newtonian. Till the very last moment, uh, I think something like uh, the last seconds, uh, the frequency is actually still increasing of the gravitational waves which are observed at large distance from the source. Right? So, so the your effect. If it happens, it only happens when, when you find a merger of the objects. Yeah? But then the signal decays, actually. There's a ring down. And it's, it's called a ring down after the merger. But, but nobody expects uh, early on to see this gravitational energy. I think this is just because you have two, two objects which have a size of a short such radius. And the orbital frequency is still in the And they come close to each other. Like this. The gravitational wave spectrum is focused around the orbital frequency. Yeah, so uh, uh, I, I'm uh, really puzzled yeah. whether uh, the, this effect has been taken into account because uh, it's, they calculate on up to around uh, six Schwarzschild radius, and that's still if you just assume that the gravitational waves are coming from that point and the redshift is. Not very large, but it's uh, um, it's a countable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fully done. Right. Yeah. So they get the frequency increase, and then after the maximum frequency, it falls off. That's what you could interpret as partly as this gravitation. Yeah. In the, in the numerical simulations, actually, what they do is that the, you don't measure the gravitational waves. Uh, locally, but you measure it from far distance. So I think this effect has been taken into account. Uh, yeah, you mentioned twice the events for the Indian detector beyond 2022, yes. but you did not mention space interpreters. Yes. Uh, for instance, for Lisa, at least the Pathfinder instruments are under development and right. yeah. aren't they? But 
I should have uh, mentioned about the, uh, this Lisa, but uh, uh, of course, as you said, Lisa has a superior capability of, for the low frequency uh, gravitational wave sources. Uh, but I just deliberately uh, omitted the Lisa because already I have too, too many things to say and I'm uh, only looking forward to the next five years or something like that. So I'm sorry, but um, Lisa is a rather a very interesting possibility that has very high signal to noise, and therefore, if there is any sources with the Lisa band, actually you can determine, uh, the, for example, luminosity distance very accurately. That's for sure. I have one question myself, if I may, and that is, if with the new advanced um, instruments. Yeah, I, I think the uh, is, uh, the biggest problem will be astronomy because we uh, rely on the uh, uh, many many assumptions and extrapolations of what that we have observed and for the neutron star neutron stars we have few examples but uh, the uh, only four or five so Poisson noise is uh, significant and uh, we don't know the selection effect and so on. So, uh, but still, that's the most robust estimation. And uh, still, the low limit, low bound of the uh, neutron star neutron star merger will be less than one per year. So, maybe we should wait for a few years, even uh, although we expect that within a few months we will be able to detect. But uh, if we don't, uh, probably we'll have to wait for a few years. But if we, we don't find after running in for a few years, then I think we have to think uh, about. But not, not general relativity itself, because uh, if you go into very strong field, there they may be different phenomena. But uh, the, the, the gravitational wave, uh, wave form we calculate is still uh, in the weak field. And in the weak field, we know that the, uh, the first Taylor person. PERSA gives exact, exactly the right result uh, as expected from the uh, general relativity. So I would rather uh, suspect about the astronomical sources. Uh, last question, short one, last short question. Uh, I have a similar question. Suppose uh, you observe the short memory first and know the distance of those kind of how definitely can you predict the gravitational signal which arrives in that? Well, if, if, if that's, that, that, yeah. yeah, probably, uh, as I said, the old short gamma ray burst observed so far lies far beyond the, uh, the advanced detector's range, which means that if we actually observe any short gamma ray burst within the, uh, within the range, First of all, they have to very, very be strong. They have to be very, very strong, and uh, they, they are, the, according to our experience, they are very, very rare because we are seeing only toward the jet direction. So um, it's much more, uh, much more difficult to observe gravitational waves based on the gamma ray burst than the uh, looking for any optical counterpart based on the gravitational waves, because gravitational waves means that they are really in a short distance and therefore uh, it may be possible to, if you use the large telescope, it may be possible to detect the counter. But the, uh, the, uh, the, main, the main point is they are usually... That's right, they're, they're, they're usually very far, very far. So it, it, uh, probably what we expect is that even though we detect the gravitational waves, we don't expect short gamma ray bursts, but because they are beaming toward different directions. And uh, therefore, we may try to find 
the optical afterglow with uh, more isotopy. But unfortunately, they tend to be uh, bright in near infrared, which is uh, difficult to observe from the ground. Okay, so um, I would say.